Hello everyone, welcome to myself and Max McGillivray from Beanstalk um, in our illustrious Beanstalk 20 on 20 series where we interview some of the most inspirational people from the international food sectors. We've got a, a lady of marble on today. Um, she's fascinating as we're going to find, find out why. why. Why is she fascinating? Well, I'm going to let you find, I'm going to let you find out why, but let, let me just give you the, the formal introduction about Barbara Bray, MBE. So Barbara Bray, her title, how do you title it? She's, she's a food safety expert and a nutritional strategic, strategic expert for the uh, for the food industry. She's also a TEDx speaker and uh, she's also an expert in food safety training. So that's all very well and good. So, so what's her background? Barbara's background has led her to become probably one of the most recognized consultants in the food sector, definitely in UK and, and Europe and um, even more so overseas in some respects. Um, after completing a, a BSc in food tech and then an MSc in post-harvest technology. Um, she then went on to do an MSc in human nutrition in 2014. Um, she became a registered nutritionist with the Association for Nutrition. Um, and on top of that, she's also a Nuffield scholar. Like, how did she fit this, uh, this all in? Since then, her work has been um, based all over the all over the world. She started off in Uganda, Uganda as part of an NGO sector project uh, with um, um, agri uh, exporting agriculture out of the country before joining uh, the international chill food business back of all on the accelerated management uh, training program. Uh, post that, she then became a, a lead auditor and um, has worked in Europe, the Middle East, and numerous um, African countries, as I've uh, indicated. Um, and she's been helping to resolve a, a number of technical issues to ensure compliance with, uh, with customers and legal requirements for both small and established businesses, um, implementing technical, technical systems, especially aligned with the likes of MRS and Tesco standards. She has a number of key uh, food clients uh, within, within the UK, and as I sort of intimated with her, uh, uh, opening title. Uh, she's also very well known as a speaker on a conventional basis and also on a, a number of webinars. And she's very kindly been involved with, the, with, with a number of our webinars. Um, she was also, and I think this is, this is amazing, she was awarded an MBE in summer 2019 for services to, uh, to food nutrition. So enough from me, let's hear from Barbara. Barbara, come on in please. Hello, Max, and thank you for that fabulous introduction. <laughs> Well, well, Barbara, I, I just, I, I, everyone, I slightly messed Barbara around because we were meant to do this um, 2020 interview um, this morning, but I've just moved into uh, into a new house and um, uh, BT um, came in and um, two two blokes and uh, two vans uh, turned up and then now uh, uh, two of your newest uh, fans, Barbara, and, and I'll tell you why, they, they got their bit sorted out, but they needed a cherry picker to come in and put this uh, this wire in. And they, they said to me, well, so Max, what, what do you do for a living? And I explained that um, I, I, I'm, I own a recruitment business and we've also got this amazing uh, project called, uh, called Beanstalk. Um, and I'm just preparing for this afternoon. I'm, I'm interviewing, if you could call it an interview, I, I'm having a chat with this uh, amazing lady called Barbara. And I said, well, what, 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 tell, us, tell us a little bit. We've got 20, 20 minutes, half an hour. What does Barbara do? And so I explained your, your background. And it was really fascinating because they've got no correlation to the sector, but they very quickly established that if it wasn't for people like you, I think collectively they had six kids. Their six kids wouldn't be getting uh, decent uh, food that was safe for them uh, to, to eat. And, and so we went through a, a little bit about, about your uh, about your background and, and how you now work and, and you help um, businesses to make sure that the the the, the technical protocol is there. So they, they compared it very much to the technical protocol they, they had within within BT. But they said to say ha hello and they want to see a copy of this, this recording uh, because one of their kids' daughters is, is thinking about doing food tech. So they're oh, definitely going to well go, 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 go learn from yourself. <laughs> so there you go, two, two new fans. So, so, so Barbara, before we get into your background to date, where, where I think people like you are fascinating, it's, it's like you, there's this expression, everyone's got a book in them, but, but with you, it, it is like you're, let, let's, let's say a third of the way, a, a, halfway through your own personal book of, of where, where you're going to go. So tell us, come on, where, where's this all going? What, what, what do you want to achieve, Barbara? You've achieved so much, but where's this all going? What do you want to achieve? Well, thanks for that gentle introduction into what is my career. Now, I think with me, what I tend to do is I like to break things down into bite-sized pieces. So 
I never at age 19 kind of went, at some point I'm going to have an MBE. It really was, you know, I was going to do all the normal stuff, just like go to university, find a job that I really like, probably get married and have kids along the way and then step back a bit, you know, a bit like my mum did. That was my career path. And then you start and you realise that there are all these opportunities life happens, things change, and you end up in a country you'd never planned on or working in with a career that you didn't even know existed. So when I picked Post Harvest Technology back in 1995, that was really exciting. And the idea that people were going to harvest fruit, put it into a plastic punnet, or harvest fresh vegetables, put them into a, a plastic pouch, and sell it as fresh and ready to eat, yeah, it was just wow. mind-blowing. It was the new sliced bread. And I wanted to be in that space of innovation and constant development. But my career went down the compliance route. But I'm now realizing that, you know, the innovation it is where it's at. That's still where my passion lies. It's about moving forward and, and doing things that are, are bigger and, and better, but better for the planet, better for health, better for the economy. Because when I started my career, it really was always about making more money and making things more efficient. And only now my generation are looking at the next generation and kind of go, oh, can you fix our mess, please? <laughs> because we really did go after volume and capacity and efficiency and the whole piece around how workers get to the, the fields or into the factories, how they're remunerated, how they're cared for, do they have enough money to manage their life? You know, that, that came in after, it really did. And it's a shame because it's taken us this long to realise that businesses have to be balanced on the whole profit, planet and, and people piece. You can't leave a bit out. And I think, you know, that's my, that's my current line of sight. What, what does, so so where, do you, oh, where, where do you think this is going to look? What's this going to look like, like 20 years out? Because you, you and I are of a sort of a grand old age that, um, what, what do they say? You can always learn from history, whether that be um, war or, or, or business or, or politics. And I, I, I tend to see um, cyclical things happening, especially like in a, in a recessionary um, period. Can you guess as to where the food sector, what it's going to look like in, in 20 years time? Are, are we going to be having hamburgers grown in, in Petri dishes? Um, are we going to have um, all our food delivered by uh, drones? Are we going to have all of our crops um, picked, picked by, by robots? And, and with you, with your background, is, is that where you're headed? Or are you one of these, I'm sure you're not, are you one of these annoying people that on your um, fridge door, you've got the 12 things I must achieve today and the 12 things I must achieve by, by year's end? Or are you slightly laissez-faire, a bit like me, and, and you just go where, where, where the excitement takes you? It's a little bit both. My fridge, I've got a fitted kitchen, so I don't, I can't stick anything on the fridge door. I haven't posh, got one of those posh. posh well, no, I haven't got one of those posh American fridges that you see when you can like press a button and all the ice comes out. So I have to go with the sticking to to-do lists that go on the actual wall rather than on the fridge. But I'm constantly looking at the next thing, more horizon scanning and the future of food is really important to me. And you'll know from when you watched my TEDx talk, when I talked about diet diversity yep. and the future of food, I was really passionate about how we, build a relationship with food and we build a good quality food environment because I think for too long we've been blaming the consumer for their choices without realizing that people choose from what's already available they're not coming along and saying well I think the supermarket needs to give me this now or they need to give me that or you know my local cafe needs to start doing things in a certain way but they're taking from what's already available and trends might come and go but it's up to our industry to be really responsible in how we do that and Yes, at a farming level, at primary agriculture, there's a bit less responsibility because you're growing the crop and you don't necessarily know how it's going to end up, whether somebody's going to deep fry it and coat it in sugar is, is not your business. But I think it's still important to understand how this all fits together and how the country's policies, so obviously once we're officially and finally out of the EU, we'll be creating our own policies. And we need to decide whether we want to support the growth of literally the growth of fruit and vegetables or whether we want to carry on subsidizing or working with livestock farmers and, and almost giving them a preferred mm. system than, than the horticulture and veg sector. And it, it's not like versus like at the moment, we really do need to get that food environment changed so it's easier to access fruit and vegetables in a convenient format. So you don't have to go and get you know, a bag of carrots, take them home, wash them. You can just snack them on the yeah. go 
and it's just very few places that do it that way at the moment. We need to and make it be more accessible. So, sorry, Barbara, and, and we're and we're in such an odd odd time. In we're, we're filming this in, in late summer two thousand and twenty, and and we had and I've mentioned it before on, on some previous podcasts. Uh, we had uh, Boris Johnson who stated that one of the reasons he got so ill on the back of COVID was because he was so um, overweight. And we as a nation, we must get fit to uh, make sure that we can counter ourselves against COVID, um, which is great. And then we had the, within the UK, we had a campaign called the Eat Out to Help Out, where the, where, where the government subsidise uh, meals um, of up to 50% for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in the whole of August. And, and Barbara, what was it? 66 million meals were, were sold. And there's this... As, as you'd expect that there's going to be exceptions but but there were um some cases of people going in day after day just yep. filling up on uh, uh, perhaps food that you could perhaps have once a week or once every other week but yes. um, and we need to have this 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 that that, this, that, that, that ridiculous oxymoron of we must be fit or oh, have, have some free free food um yesterday i went shopping with them um, with with my boys and one of them probably you wouldn't believe this i, I didn't know they still existed but one of them bought pop tarts do you remember pop tarts? Oh. These horrible things full of jam that you put in a toaster. I didn't know they still existed. Oh, no. so, so, so he had one, and luckily he thought he thought it was disgusting. He threw the the, the, the whole pack away. And going back to your, your bit about uh, about um, the, the the retailer, is it actually up to the retailer to uh, guide us, dictate guide us as to what we should be eating uh, to, to to give us good health, or is it up the up to the consumer, um, or is it up up to the government? That's where I think it's fascinating with someone like yourself, if you're able to guide the food sector that we we so we have such a duty of care now to make sure that the, the consumer is fit and well because of covid because of the cost within the uk of the um nhs one third of all um adults are, are obese and, and the the knock-on that that's going to give to to the nhs but but barbara do you think that the food sector is listening in, in that if you did promote something uh, to them, which, which as much as possible is future-proof, is fit and healthy, but doesn't make as much margin as Pop-Tarts, uh, Pop do, do you think the food industry will listen to you? The food industry, it's a bit like people. So you've got a range of personalities, a range of different businesses, and there are always the, the ones, the early adopters out front there, leading the way and making change. And eventually that spreads to the rest of the industry. And I think it's like anything, it will be a movement that comes. So people, you know, I've got people contacting me looking at how they can do things differently. So people are definitely thinking about it, but obviously there's a big piece of work that needs to be done between having that thought that, yes, I need to do the responsible thing and provide healthy food and actually being able to do it. And, you know, we did see at the last Oxford Farming Conference, there was a whole panel of people talking with Dave, uh, with um, Henry Dimbleby and Sir David then. <laughs> he was nowhere near the conference. It was I bet there. he's never had that before. <laughs> exactly. It's like, how did I just do that? <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, Greg's were talking about what they do, about reducing the calorie content and working on initiatives. But everybody needs to come to the party because if they don't, it's not a level playing field. And when you look at, Public Health England, for the last two years, they've been talking about how they want to take everybody down the road of reducing the overall number of calories and put um, calories on menus. So when you go to restaurants and, and what have you, you'll be able to see that. And these are a range of tools that are out there. I don't say it's the, all the tools in the toolkit. I do think you need different tools for different occasions and for different people. Some people don't read menus and, and don't read labels and there's others who are quite happy to be told what to do so there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach there are some people who are creatures of habit and it doesn't matter what you do they won't change their behavior but by generally adapting the food environment and making those the right choices easier it at least is going to nudge some people in the right direction so if you look at examples of what's happening in the, the fast food industry where people are using their the kind of little screens and tablets when you go into store and you tap on what you want they're putting things like the the water and the low sugar drinks at the top so people see those first and go for the low sugar option or the water rather than the full mm -hmm. sugar option so there are various nudges that organizations can do and in my opinion i think it's those sorts of nudges that have helped people change their behavior on sugary drinks rather than the, the sugar tax because the sugar tax it doesn't grab you at the throat when you go and pay for your meal because it's part of an overall meal but when you see that screen and you 
you tap on the screen what you want to have. If the first thing that comes up is acceptable, that's what you're going to go with. And I think actually that has a much bigger influence on consumer behaviour than the government policy. So I think we do need the industry to take the initiative and, and leverage the influence that they've got to try and make those changes in people's behaviour. I go back to your, your two newest fans, um, Carl and Craig, the, the BT engineers. I, I forgot to mention, uh, one of them is a, is a vegetarian. Um, his, oh. his, his daughter managed to convert the whole family to, to um, a vegetarian diet. And you would have never have seen that 10 years ago. And, and perhaps I'm being too harsh on, on, the, on the UK consumer that um, if you've got the, the likes of a, a working man who's up a ladder day in, day, day yeah. in, day out, um, all day, um, um, sticking, sticking wires everywhere, you'd expect him just to be in a trucker's cap. But he, he very proudly, on the back of the conversation we're having about you, showed me his, his packed lunch and his granola and, and his uh, dried, dried nuts and things. Uh, he did say that occasionally he has a, the sneaky bacon button butty on a, on, a, on a Sunday. But I thought yeah. that, 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 that was fascinating. That, so again, is it the consumer that yes. is now, especially with the likes of social media and some of the um, amazing controversial films that are coming out on the likes of Netflix about, um, about the uh, uh, animal husbandry and, and the likes of other countries, not, not, not the UK, uh, where, where it's obviously, obviously uh, very good, that the consumer is now getting influence. And because of that, they're going into store and they're looking for specific products. And so the store is now having to, thank crikey, drop the Pop-Tarts and actually go down more, more of a vegetarian sector. I, I hadn't been into an M&S store for a while and, and I was um, positively aghast as, as to the vegetarian options that, that, that were there because if uh, r r retailers are, are in, in retail to make money and if they realize that the, the market swing that the, the the mood music is going in a particular manner the, the more likely to go so is that more of an open door to, to yourself to be able to influence the food sector as well as the as the, as the retailers is, is that assisting you well i'd like to think so when i did my nuffield farming project back in 2017 one of the findings that i communicated when i presented i said look if the, the fresh produce industry doesn't step up then the meat substitute industry will, will steal a march. And if you look at that market now, it's in double digit growth. Well, yeah. which fruit and vegetables are in double digit growth? I can't name any off wow. the top of my head. So it's obvious that we haven't done what we need to as an industry to promote that. So whether it's within the, the prepared, and I do know that prepared sales obviously took a dip during the, the pandemic because you know people weren't going and stopping at food to go. They were just buying what they needed that was an essential. But I think we can still get back there. We can still encourage people to eat that's in a way that you know, includes more variety. And, and with, with some of those um, ve vegetarian offerings, that they're, they're not cheap. Um, I, I remember um, going to a city food lecture, and I'm going to go for four or five years ago. And it, I can't remember the chap's name, but he was the vice president of PepsiCo uh, for the mm. for the whole of Europe. Um, and Chris White of Fruitnet Media asked him in, in the Q and A session, uh, "When are you going to start selling bananas?" And, and this, this chap's retort was, when you can show me how to make money out of selling bananas. Um, and again, here, here is the, the, the issue, and we talked about it on webinars that we've done before, the lack of branding within, within the, the yes. fresh produce sector and retailers ideally don't want companies to have a brand because they have enough of a fight with the Kellogg's Corn Flakes and the Coca-Colas and, um, and, and, the, and the drink um, people who've got a, a brand and, and create better negotiation leverage. So to, to come... Let's, let's get down to specifics then, um, Barbara. What, what would you like to see the fresh produce sector do to benefit from this, this perhaps upsurge of, of fresh produce consumption so, so it's not being cannibalised by these new uh, uh, startups with a double-digit growth? What can the fresh produce sector do to benefit from this uh, upsurge of, uh, of fresh produce sales? I think it takes a multidisciplinary approach because at the moment we're all focusing on let's get the product to the retailer, let the retailer do the work. But you have to look at what government policies are out there and what's out there from the different think tanks and various organisations who are all talking about the changes that we need to make and really get involved. And then you'll see that there are options. I think it's, it's too easy to say, well, it's, it's not necessarily my problem. I'm doing what I need to do. But being there out front and centre and campaigning and making sure that if there is an opportunity, we can grasp it. So looking for funding, for in investment in innovation and creating new things and also research. 
that's going to be a great thing. I know we don't have branding, but that doesn't mean we can't have branding. So if you look at some of the businesses that are being really successful at the moment, there are people who started with nothing, with just a YouTube channel at age 14, managing to turn out huge successful businesses. So communicating directly with the consumer can be done. But I think the other thing we need to walk away from is just focusing on you have to eat healthily. People don't just eat because it's beneficial for their health. We eat because it's cultural, we eat because it's social, and we eat obviously because we have to. So there's a whole range of reasons behind why we eat. And if we're only trying to tick one of the boxes, then we're missing a trick. Because obviously the people who are in the alcohol selling trade, they've never once had to use the, the word health in selling their product, yeah. and it sells quite well. So we need to to turn it on its head and look at how we communicate with people. If you can't convince people that eating fruit and vegetables is fun and it's delicious and you've got a whole range of colors and it adds vitality to your life and it helps you with your, support your immune system. There are, there are a whole range of different things that we can say to people and talk about having a social and shared experience that includes fruit and vegetables. It's not impossible. Mm. I just think we need to step away from just banging the health drum and look at how we can offer things in a convenient way. So if people are traveling, they can access fresh and healthy food. If people are at work, they can access it. So if you think of you know, police, ambulance, people like that, how often do they get a chance on their, their shift to stop off and just grab something that is a healthy snack? You know, Often they're gonna to have to go somewhere that's selling donuts or pasties or yep. chicken and chips because the, the other types of food that really would be helpful for them to eat just aren't front and center when they're going out and, and getting or making their food choices so it's not necessarily that people are constantly making the wrong choices we've got to put the choices out there for them uh, yesterday at my um, my my kids rugby i got, I got uh, two boys who play rugby and um, i was looking on the opposing pitch and there was a there must have been about 30 16 year olds and, and these guys are very impressive fit as fleas um <laughs> running around but, but during uh, uh, but the, the most entertaining perhaps sad but entertaining thing is is that uh, with the rugby training um they can't physically touch a, a rugby ball and pass a rugby ball to each other because of covid so they're, they're, <laughs> they're throwing virtual rugby balls to each other but they but they're doing a, a huge amount of um uh, sprint um, exercises um, halfway through the, the break one of the dads turned up with a carton of apples and you've never seen so many apples being demolished by 30 <laughs> ravenous 16 year olds and then they got back on it and i, th I thought so this because again but you've heard me say it too many times before to me the in my simplistic world that the cure to the obesity crisis is simple it's just more exercise and eating more fresh produce and the, i thought that was a uh, real case of point <laughs> go on yeah, you're not going to get accepted on a place at the AFM with that sort of attitude. <laughs> the causes of obesity are really complex. And I've often said I that I'd know. rather boil my head than break it down into, into <laughs> things that are easy to understand. But it is my job. So I'm going to put my okay. big girl pants on sure. and tell you that we need to be mindful of people's health, of their socioeconomic status. So obviously poverty plays a is a huge factor totally. in whether people yeah. are obese or not. And also the food environment and access to good quality and nutritious food. So it isn't just as simple as eat less and move more because there are things like stress that increase, oh, like, you know, they change your so hormones. And, yep. Yeah, so the, it's, when people say eat less and move more, yes, that can work in a certain context, but it's not a one size fits all approach for everybody. And we also know that within different ethnicities, you don't even need to be fat to get type two diabetes. My own journey with pre-diabetes started well before I put on any weight and I'm still not overweight. So clearly we need to think about the causes of, of different diseases. And if we can manage type two diabetes and, and pre-diabetes by a healthy diet, that's a much more positive message than telling somebody who's already obese or overweight, they have to lose yeah. weight because we know that in 95% of cases, when people lose weight, the weight just comes back on because the body goes back to its set point. So the whole eat less and move more has a limited impact. I've, I've never been so eloquently told off. Apart, apart from the last time you told me off. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And that's why, I, that's why I love Barbara and, and, and working with people like Barbara because I, I, I claim to be a broadcaster, but I, I'm just a bloke with a, with a microphone and I need to be directive so that hopefully everyone else watching and listening could actually hear from the experts rather than someone in a, in a, in a very bad pink shirt. Um, just just going go back to uh, the Dimbleweed report, there'd be quite a few people internationally who won't know what that was. 
Um, not trying to put you on the spot, but can you just um, tell everyone what the purpose of the Dimbleby report within the UK is? And have there been any initial results from it? Because it, it, it is fascinating. Yeah, so it started off as a, a national food strategy. When I say national, I mean national as in the, the nation of England. So it's not a UK wide, it's a, an England national food strategy. So it was brought in to look at how we can move forward because we don't have a strategy. And obviously, leaving the EU, we were going to need one because we can't rely on the strategy that's been prepared by the EU. So the original brief was to look at everything. So the whole entire food system, the food supply chain, consumers, retail, the whole thing. Obviously, once COVID happened from February 2020, COVID-19 in 2020, it's confusing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It just put a, not necessarily a spanner in the works, but it, it changed the framing of it because we then realised it drew a light on the plight of people who were on low incomes and who had low um, health outcomes anyway before that happened because we were seeing that COVID-19 actually had a much bigger impact on those people. So food insecurity in, in UK households and a lot of countries went up. So the part one report was released. I don't think it was ever supposed to be in two parts, but this is where we're now at. So we've had a okay. part one that's come out. And it's looked at everything from how we make sure that the poorest children are supported. So, for example, increasing the number of free school meal vouchers that go to the, the poorest children to make sure that as many children as possible can get a decent meal. And other things. So this... It actually came out, I think, was it two or three days after the Public Health England initiative? So I can't remember which way around it, it happened or what came out first. I think it came out just after. And it did talk about TV advertising, how we don't want to have um, high fat, salt and sugar foods advertised after 9 p.m., which sounds like a good idea. But when you realise that, you know, cheese, for example, is a high fat food yeah. and it's quite a nutritious yeah. food. So it's how you frame that. How do you explain to the food industry what is acceptable to um, advertise after 9 p.m. and what isn't. So we do need that, that level of detail. We do need a conversation on some of these measures. So he's starting to pull out a raft of measures or a raft of recommendations, I would say. And then part two will follow later. So part two will really get into the meat and bones of, of how we're going to build our strategy and look at the way that our, our food supply chain works and our, our primary agriculture works and how retail works and how it all pulls together. So I'm hoping that part two will really focus on the things that we need to change where part one has really talked about our opportunity to make things better after COVID-19. And the only thing that I, I guess was missing from that is the actions that, that will be put in place. I don't really see anything that's going to fundamentally drive a health improvement. So if I look at my own community, people who have low vitamin D levels and, you know, really prone to prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. I think if we don't act quickly, we will miss an opportunity to let people know that they have to not just take vitamin D because it's going to be supportive of the immune system, but have to get it to a really decent level because otherwise it's just not going to work. And we can save so many people, not just from COVID, but from a whole range of complications if that message on vitamin D gets out having a really good supported immune system in, well, not just in my community, but everybody needs mm, to have exactly. that. And it will affect people's ability to recover from all sorts of illnesses, not just COVID. So, so do you think the DBB report will be groundbreaking um, or, or, or are we just on this, 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 this road, a bit like politics, with, with no overall direction, no, no overall thought as to where, where the food strategy is going? Or, or am I just being naive again? Well, there's still time I and mean, I have no idea how, how part two is going to land. Obviously, part one was very different to what we all anticipated because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it has highlighted what was already there and shone a spotlight on it. But unless we really take that and grab it and say, let's make changes, then the health of the, the poorest part of society is not going to change. And when you look back to the 1980s, we had so many problems that we managed to to improve on, but it seems like we're sliding backwards. So the Michael Marmot report that came out in 2010 said, we're not in a good place, we need to fix it because poverty is really having an impact on our health, our life expectancy is starting to reduce. Yep. And then in 2020, he said, well, you know what I said in 2010, that's still happening. Yeah. So 
you know, we shouldn't be in a situation where our life expectancy is getting shorter if you don't live in the right postcode. I mean, yeah. we're in 2020, we should be able to have more people living to the end of their natural life in good health rather than having 10 years of really poor health and debilitating disease and then dying. I mean, who wants that? Yep, and, and my, my worry, having, as, as you know, travelled a fair bit through the likes of Africa, is seeing the duplication um, of, of uh, uh, what's happened in the likes of the UK and America happening in the likes of South Africa, that the, the, the yes. diet has, has so, so yes, there is, I, I totally agree with you, there is time to, to change it, but the time needs to be now. And, and um, ho hopefully on, on the back of the, the whole COVID situation, uh, there will be that awakening so we can change the, the, the food structure in the UK, Europe, this, globally, um, so that people can, can live longer and, um, and, and not have uh, um, shorter lifespans through our own, our own creation. Oh, definitely. I think unless we get on top of inequality and, and address that widening wealth gap, then we're not going to get on top of it because the UN has recognised and it's published that the wider that gap grows of inequality, the worse the health outcomes of people will be. So it's following a set pattern. It's not a surprise to anybody. We just haven't taken the action to address that. Yeah, well done. Now, food. Barbara, you could have gone off into any sector and, 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 and you could have made a, a, a wheelbarrow of, of dosh uh, going into business for a bank or, or, or going into politics or, or uh, be, being, um, uh, here we go, a, sp a sports person. You could have been an Olympic swimmer. Um, but you, you went into this, this mad, mad world of, of food and everyone I meet in food from agriculture all the way up through the supply chain, you cut them in half and they just read the, the, the food, the sp specific sector that they're in. Uh, we, we have a number of um, universities that are dialed into these, uh, to th these interviews. And also, as we intimated earlier, I think a number of younger people who, who start to watch them, especially through the likes of our Facebook um, business. Why would you recommend people get into the food sector? Why should people be involved with fresh food? Firstly, it's important. We all need to eat. And because it's so important, it's fundamental to our life, but also, as I mentioned before, our culture and society. It's a great industry to be in. You can influence so much change and develop products and you can learn so much. It's an industry, it, you don't have to be a food technologist, for example. You can be an engineer working on equipment. You can be involved in IT. You can be involved in artificial intelligence. There are so many different aspects to the, the food industry and the production of food that just make it a fascinating place to work. And the way I really experienced my career, there were so many different people from all walks of life involved in it. So it's, I'd say it's a more inclusive environment to be in than some of the other sectors that okay. I've seen. So, Fantastic. you know, I never was drawn to working in the NHS where my parents were. That just seemed like too much stress. I mean, I did actually choose the food industry because I thought, well, I won't have to work at weekends, not bank holidays. <laughs> so oh. when I started my career, I was like, oh, nobody <laughs> told me that. But things still grow at a weekend. <laughs> they still need to be picked and harvested at a weekend. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I was a bit naive, but you know. <laughs> so, so, we, so you would recommend that people get uh, involved in the food sector, perhaps over other sectors, because, because food does good? Food does do good. I mean, obviously, you can do a little bit of bad with food, but food generally does good because you're feeding people, keeping them alive, providing them with enjoyment, with sustenance with cultural experiences, with, with new experiences. And it's a great industry to be part of and, and feeding people it, it is rewarding. Yeah, it's great agreed. to go into a, a supermarket or a restaurant and see a product that you've been working with or been part of it. It's a fantastic feeling. I, and I, I love when I visit uh, growers, uh, when, when I went to South Africa and uh, went to the very, very blessed to go to the Hex River Valley um, to see grape. And I uh, was looking at this, uh, this uh, amazing grape um, and the South African farmer, he did this re really interesting thing. He grabbed my hand and he grabbed the, the, the grapes that I was also holding. He looked me in the eye and said, Max, we grow sunshine. Tell every kid that you come across, we grow sunshine. So when, when I've done loads, loads of school presentations, so it's, yeah, it's a bit different to um, make, making a mobile phone, which is <laughs> we're, we're all wedded to the things but actually fresh food that the fact that it is grown in the soil and it's grown grown from sunshine and it does do uh does 
obviously good with all, all the other uh, con conditions uh, as above. Uh, it, it is a, a fascinating sector to, uh, to to be involved with. So, so Barbara, just, just before we, we, we wrap up, you, you very cutely uh, swerved my, my question from, from the beginning. So oh. you've, <laughs> you, you've got this uh, amazing academic background. You, you're mm. a Nuffield scholar. Um, you got this. You had this amazing MBA, uh, MBE, sorry, to be awarded to uh, last summer for services to food nutrition. What's next? We all want to hear what's next. What is Barbara going to achieve in the next five to ten years? Please tell us. My latest project is healthy and sustainable food. So I've set up this forum on on LinkedIn, and I'm looking at bringing in people from across different sectors. So not just agriculture and food industry, but pharma, health education and finance so talking to banks talking to people in pharmaceuticals uh, talking to medics about how we can bring a multidisciplinary group of people together who want to work on projects that can deliver healthy and sustainable food to the population so what we'll do is we'll have a series of broadcasts that we're going to do with beanstalk global over the next six months mm -hmm. and we'll pick out six different topics across where we'll give case studies and just show people whether they're consumers whether they're businesses, these are the initiatives that are out there that you can copy and paste and, and do in your own business or get inspiration from because it's about driving behavior change for me. And if you can show people what can be done, that will hopefully drive the momentum for and industry to change and consumers to change. Barbara, fantastic. And, and we're so proud to be able to um, host these uh, broadcasts on, on the Beanstalk um, Global uh, website uh, platform. Yeah, just, just what, we're going to be doing them monthly and you'll, you'll see all the social media and you'll be able to see all, all the records if, if you're listening to this uh, a little bit later on and um barbara we need an avatar from yourself if people want to engage with you on a consultancy basis on a technical consultancy basis how, how do they find you how, how do they engage with you please so my website is www.allo-solutions.com so i'd like to think you put a link to it somewhere yeah yeah top and bottom. also <laughs> and also if they want to engage with healthy and sustainable food then that's the name of the page that's currently on linkedin so you can reach me by email barbara at allo-solutions.com and i'm available for consultancy in food safety nutrition strategy so if you're desperate to get out there and find out how your business can pivot and work towards bringing healthy and sustainable food into the into society then i'm your person Barbara, what, what, what a great, great way to end. Barbara, as, we, as you now know, has got a, an amazing background and I'm sure there's more to come. She's, she's sometimes too modest, I reckon. I reckon there's some, some other big things coming along over the next five, 10 years. She's a lady to watch. We're, we're pleasure to have her on uh, Beanstalk for, for us to host this, uh, this ongoing broadcast that, the, that you'll see more of. Barbara, thank you very much for your time. You keep safe and we, we look forward to working with you very closely in the future. Fantastic, thank you ever so much. Well done, Barbara. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.